And we are back with chapter two of this beginner's guide to Fire Emblem Six on hard mode. This chapter features a lot more enemy variety, but I would actually say it's a little easier compared to the first one, since you get so many new units to play around with. The chapter itself can basically be broken down into two fronts. The first one is around the first fort to the south of your starting position, and the second one consists of two more forts in front of a larger pack of enemies. The village to the north of your starting position gives you an armor slayer. This is going to be useful against the boss later on. The armory to the north sells basic iron weapons as well as javelins, while the vendor to the east sells vulneraries. Chapter 2 starts you off with two new playable units, the first one being Merlinus, your convoy unit. He cannot fight, but he is incredibly unique in that when he is killed, he merely retreats. This makes Merlinus a great unit to sack if you ever find yourself in a situation where one of your units is about to die, so you can sort of treat him as an extra life. While Merlinus sadly takes up a deployment slot in the later chapters, keep in mind that he doesn't need to be present on the battlefield for you to send items to his convoy. He can level up in this game, but it requires him to be attacked 100 times, so chances are you won't see this at all. The second new unit you get from the start is the Cleric Ellen. Not much to say about this one, she's a walking heal staff and that's pretty much about it. You'll be very glad to have her as your units will be taking constant damage on hard mode, but with 16 HP and 0 base defense, she is very liable to get one shot by even the weak enemies like soldiers, so you have to constantly watch the enemy range. If you do decide to train her up and later promote her, she becomes a useful glass cannon, but guiding rings are rare in this game and there are far better units to promote. Still, you'll probably end up deploying Ellen in every chapter for quite a while, her healing never stops being useful. With that out of the way, let's begin by talking about how you should approach the start of the map. You want to begin the first turn by having Marcus end up on the forge, but his movement alone can't take him there, so simply clear away the first soldier standing in your way, and then have Boris pick Marcus up and drop him onto the fort with one of your other calves. Make sure Marcus is wielding a javelin so he can counter the three fighters, who are all wielding hand axes. Being at a weapon triangle disadvantage means Marcus might not land both of his counterattacks, but he doesn't need to. As long as he hits each of the fighters at least once, they should be low enough for your other units to finish off. While the rest of your guys are fighting, I recommend sending Merlinus up to the northern village to get the armor slayer, as well as visiting the shop and the armory to do some basic supply gathering. I advise getting one of each iron weapon and at least three javelins, as well as a handful of vulneraries. On turn two, you get some reinforcements showing up from the south, and they start off as blue units, which is very welcome. Let's take a look at these mercenaries, starting with the captain himself, Deke. Deke is an incredibly useful unit. His bases are much higher than anyone else in your army at this point aside from Marcus. But unlike Marcus, Deke's growth rates are actually kinda decent, meaning he's a far more useful unit to invest into long term. Armed with his Iron Blade, Deke can one round some units from full health in his joining chapter, even on hard mode, which is incredibly useful. He's quite durable too and can survive easily on the front lines. You'll be using Deke a lot on hard mode, and that's completely okay. Don't be afraid to give him kills, he'll stay consistently useful for most of the game. Shana is your first Pegasus Knight. While her damage output and durability sucks, her flying allows her some excellent mobility. She can traverse impassable terrain and rescue drop units into position. It's hard for Shana to get kills in the early game due to the large amount of axe users and archers walking about, but it's not impossible, you just have to carefully set up kills for her. If you do decide to train her, she will become useful in combat eventually, especially after she promotes and can wield swords. It all depends on how much you're willing to invest into her. I personally don't bother training Shana most of the time, but feel free to do it if you want. She won't let you down. Wade is the first of your two fighters, and he's not great. He may occasionally hit hard, but only when he actually lands his hits, which won't happen often due to his pitiful base skill and Binding Blade's awful hit rate on Axis. Even when the stars align and Wade goes up against slow enemies with weapon triangle advantage, it is rare to see his hit rates go above 70%, which means there's always some gambling involved. Wade's 20% speed growth also means he struggles to keep up even if you do invest into him. But one aspect to the fighters of Binding Blade, which is quite underappreciated, are their humongous promotion gains. So if you decide to early promote, they will be quite useful for a while. But there are far better ways to spend your hero crests in this game, and not many of them to go around. I recommend you use Wade for some high, albeit unpredictable damage when you need it, and bench him later on once he starts falling off. 
The other fighter, Lot, is pretty much the same deal. Compared to Wade, he has more speed and defense, but he struggles with a pretty mediocre strength growth of 30%, meaning he won't improve much offensively. I'd say he's still a little better than Wade in that he can take a few more hits and he won't start getting doubled as easily on hard mode, but a fighter that can't do much damage stops being useful incredibly quickly. As with Wade, use Lot for what he's worth and then bench him later on. Now back to the game. As soon as your new allies are in position, you should aim to take the two forts closest to them. I like to place Deke on the northern fort and one of my fighters on the other. It doesn't really matter which one you pick, they both perform pretty similarly on this chapter. Just make sure whoever you place there has a hand axe equipped to counter the javelin wielding soldiers. Shanna can certainly join in on the fun with some javelin shipping of her own, but I prefer having her fly north to fetch the armor slayer from Merlinus, and ferry it across the mountain where it will become useful against the boss later on. Even though some of the soldiers will be throwing javelins with weapon triangle advantage against Deke, his innate tankiness combined with the defenses from the fort should be more than enough to keep him alive. If you've cleared the initial pack of enemies back at your starting position, Marcus is in an excellent position to pick up Roy and carry him across the map. I like to use the other fighter that I didn't put on the fort to rescue drop Roy onto the scene right away so he can join the action. You can use the other two cavaliers to pick up Bolt and Ellen if you want some extra assistance, but I often find their contribution unnecessary. Once you've survived the initial onslaught of the enemies, the rest of the map becomes a simple bait and switch, clearing enemies up to the boss one by one. And speaking of the boss, this time around we are going up against a very rude armor knight. Most of your units won't do crap to this guy, as he has a ton of defense and is on a gate. He also has a javelin, which means he'll always counter you, but there's a handful of easy ways to dispatch him. The quickest is to have Deke use the armor slayer. Even with weapon triangle disadvantage, he tends to one round the boss from full health, because the armor slayer is really busted stat-wise in FE6. You can also give the armor slayer to Marcus, or have him use the silver lance, though you probably want to conserve it a little bit, as it will be very useful in the upcoming chapters. You might think Wade's hammer is an alternative, but in Binding Blade, the hammer has a ridiculous 45% base hit, meaning this strategy becomes incredibly unreliable. You might also think that Roy's rapier can be useful here, but it won't. Its might is simply too low. Your best bet is really just to use that armor slayer. <gasps> Before you seize with Roy, I recommend equipping your guys with appropriate weapons, as you won't get battle preparations until chapter 6. So make sure both your cavaliers have access to javelins, that Roy has a spare iron sword so you won't have to waste his rapier, and that most of your units have vulneraries on them. You can use Shanna to go back to Merlinus and fetch any important items you may have missed. And with that, you've beaten yet another chapter of Fire Emblem 6 on hard mode. Up next is chapter 3. I hope you guys like soldiers, because you'll be fighting a lot of them here. But not to worry, you'll be getting some assistance from a true Chad. As always, leave a like and a comment if you found this guide useful, and I'll be back again soon with another episode. My name is Mengs, thank you for watching, and bye bye.